I really see this kind of not so much as two separate things, even though I'll be giving two separate seminars and we write our proposals in these two different ways, but I really see intellectual merit and, and broader impacts as being interwoven, very much like a tapestry. And that's really my theme of, of today, is how intellectual merit and broader impacts can be seen as interwoven threads that, that complement each other while still remaining pure in terms of what they start out to be. So in terms of tapestry, um, intellectual merit and broader impacts can be viewed as a tapestry. But I think also when I climb into rainforest trees and look out on the canopy, I see the canopy and the rainforest as a tapestry as well, as a set of interweaving threads of species, of interactions that really create something that is more than just the parts, something that's complex, something that's connected, something that's strong but fragile, uh, something that's useful and also something that's beautiful. And so I'd like to sort of talk about that idea of, ca of tapestry and I'll, I'll start out with these two people. These are my parents, this is my mom and my dad. Um, and they themselves actually created sort of a tapestry in me and my siblings. My dad was from India, he was a Hindu, uh, he was a scientist who worked for the National Institutes of Health, very quiet, uh, sort of reserved fellow. Uh, my mother, on the other hand, was of Russian heritage, an Orthodox Jew, uh, grew up in Brooklyn, New York, very outgoing, studied languages and communication. And so uh, those parents of mine really created in me a tapestry of the two of them. I also had myself a tapestry of interest as a young kid, both climbing trees and loving trees, but also being very interested in the arts, especially in modern dance. And as I grew and developed, I realized that my calling was really to study the forest canopy, an area of the of tropical and temperate rainforest that was pretty much, when I was a graduate student 35 years ago, kind of an unknown territory. The canopy was called the last biotic frontier. And for the first few years of my career and the careers of those who studied forest canopy organisms, we kind of focused on just getting up there safely and non-destructively using uh, mountain climbing techniques, uh, construction cranes, hot air balloons, and canopy walkways. And when I get up into the forest canopy, for instance, in the canopy of Monteverde Cloud Forest in, in Costa Rica, I see a tapestry as well, this tapestry of canopy-dwelling plants, the branches on which they perch, the birds that come in to pollinate and disperse fruits, the invertebrates that live there, really a tapestry uh, that, that at that time was relatively poorly known. And so what I'd like to do today is to tell you first a little bit about some of the aspects of the primary uh, tropical rainforest canopy organisms and interactions, focusing first on diversity, their role in ecosystem cycles, and finally wildlife resources. But then to go on to some of the ways that I've used uh, this information, this, these ideas to weave a tapestry of these intellectual merits into the broader impacts that I've carried out. So in terms of uh, diversity of these canopy plants, it's very high. There are over 83, there are 83 families that have epiphytic members, 29,000 species. And in some cases, some forests have been documented as having over half of the plant diversity, the overall vascular plant diversity, as being in the epiphytic component. There are also a tremendous number of species of non-vascular plants, of bryophytes, of mosses, of liverworts, of hornworts that live in the forest canopy. Uh, they tend to be overlooked just because they're lower vascular plants, but these, these have tremendous diversity, and as I'll talk about in just a minute, they also have quite a lot of um, ecosystem function uh, uh, importance. One thing that has always fascinated me about tropical rainforest canopies that have this large component of epiphytes are the canopy soils that accumulate beneath these live epiphytes that are composed of dead and decomposing live epiphytes. Uh, they comprise really what is a histosol, a high, highly organic soil, um, uh, both in tropical and temperate rainforests. Um, I want to mention also that not only is there high plant diversity, there's also very high insect diversity. I'm not going to get that into that in this talk, but I am related to an, in, an entomologist who has uh, done a lot of work with canopy insects. This is actually my husband right here when I met him uh, 35 years ago in Corcovado National Park. Um, he studies ants, he's an ant taxonomy, and when, uh, when he proposed to me, he said, you know, Nalini, if you marry me, I will name an ant after you. <laughs> and so I couldn't resist, and so in fact he has named an ant after me, as well as to our two children. Um, so we're a family of four that actually has, everybody has an ant named after them. So this is just to tell, remind you that there's a tremendous diversity, there are new species being discovered all the time uh, in the world of invertebrates, but also in the world of microbes. 
So that's a little bit of a, a little bit of a knowledge about um, <clears throat> about diversity. My true in, my true passion about understanding epiphytes is not about their diversity or what these plants are named, but rather their function in the ecosystem as a whole. And so one of the things that I learned early on in my research is that these epiphytic communities, because of their ability to absorb, intercept, and retain nutrients that are contained in rainfall, in dry deposition, and in mist in these tropical cloud forests, might be very important in terms of the interception and retention of allochthonous nutrients, that is, nutrients that are coming from outside the ecosystem. And some of the work that I did with one of my students, Ken Clark, has showed that 60% of the incoming nitrate coming into the canopy is actually absorbed and retained by canopy components, the epiphytes, particularly the bryophytes, um, and as, as well as the dead organic matter that holds on to these positively charged cations on their negatively charged sites. In terms of bird use of epiphytes, I've also worked with uh, people who are are capable of, of um, identifying birds, Terry Madelson in particular. Um, we spent one summer up in the forest canopy recording the birds that were coming into our canopy plots, and we, we documented which birds were coming to host tree flowers and fruits and resources versus epiphyte fruits and flowers and other resources. And we found that about a third of all of the foraging visits of these birds actually came to the epiphytic component of the canopy rather than the host tree. So for all of these reasons, their diversity, their role in intercepting and retaining nutrients, and their provision of resources uh, for the arboreal animals that live there, it seems that these epiphytic communities are very important to the ecosystem as a whole. And if that is the case, it seemed to me that we needed to understand what would happen if if there was disturbance to these epiphyte communities. And so I carried out, uh, starting early on, an experiment where we stripped mats of epiphytes um, from branches. We replicated these, strip, these strippings. Um, and we want to, I wanted to know how fast they would come in. And I predicted that it would be very rapid because these epiphytes are so diverse, so lush, and so uh, prolific, it seemed that they would be coming in very rapidly. And I also predicted that they would encroach from the side rather than uh, like, like grass on a sidewalk. Well, I was wrong on both counts, actually. What I found was that it took a very long time for these epiphytes to grow back. This was year one, uh, where we removed those epiphytes. This is year 22, and you can see that in terms of percent cover, <clears throat> only 40% of the cover has returned. So it takes a very long time for these epiphytes to recover after disturbance. I also found through observations that in fact these epiphytes are, are returning not through encroachment like grass on a sidewalk, but rather coming from the bottom. They, I saw this green scuzz on the bottom of branches, which then over time gradually grew up and around until it finally circumscribed the entire branch when other, other epiphytes started colonizing. So it turns out that this tapestry within the canopy is not as robust and connected as I had presumed, but rather is sort of a fragile kind of community within the forest as a whole. And I realized also, sort of sitting up there, enjoying the collecting of epiphytes and making measurements, that in fact the forest as a whole is fragile and is vulnerable to disturbances, especially human disturbances. And I recall one day in particular, especially, I was sitting up in the forest canopy and I heard the sound of a chainsaw just outside the reserve border. And I realized, as a young scientist, that maybe I needed to do something about the things that were going on with tropical forests and their interaction with humans, with deforestation, with forest fragmentation, with global climate change, with invasive species. And it was at that time then I began to think about the broader impacts of my work. Observing that there was mining going on, observing that there's uh, forest conversion going on, uh, observing and measuring actually that there's a negative effect of climate change that's already going on in these tropical montane cloud forests that are experiencing longer and longer dry periods without that nourishing mist and fog upon which these epiphytes depend. At the same time I was becoming aware of these things going on in tropical rainforests, I was also becoming aware of the increasing distance between humans and nature. More than half of us now live in urban environments, getting more and more distanced from the resources of the therapeutic values of nature that we used to uh, enjoy <clears throat> in past times. And I began thinking about ways that I might be able to connect humans not only with 
information about the canopy, but nature in general. So in 1994, I started a nonprofit called the International Canopy Network, or ICANN. Um, I and my, and my forest canopy researcher colleagues began publishing papers uh, in, in adult magazines and children's magazines, giving talks, uh, working with National Geographic to make videos and television programs. And for a while, I thought, wow, we're really doing great stuff. Uh, giving this information about how important, how fragile, how wonderful, how useful, how beautiful forest canopies are. But I soon realized that really the people who pick up a National Geographic, who would visit a botanical garden, who would watch a nature documentary are people like, like you guys and me, that is people who already understand the importance of trees and forests and the need to protect them. And so I felt what I needed to do was to think of ways I could get this information, get my feelings, my love, my passion for trees and forests to people who live in places like this. That is, to a little girl who grew up in a city like this, unlike me who had the, the wonderful opportunity to grow up climbing trees, how might we get her interested and connected to trees and forest canopies? Well, this was my first attempt, which was treetop Barbie. <laughs> the idea that perhaps we could modify um, the existing sort of stereotype of, of Barbie and her Barbie body. Um, but we, I then decided to call Mattel and ask them whether they might make a treetop Barbie. And they, as you might imagine, were not interested. Um, so we said, the, the students in my lab said, well, we can do this ourselves. So we now go out, we buy used Barbies. We have volunteer seamstresses who create her little outfits. Um, but most important, Treetop Barbie goes out with, um, <clears throat> with a little booklet about, tree, about plants that live in the rainforest canopies of the Pacific Northwest. So Barbie then becomes an ambassador. She becomes a vector of information to little girls who respect Barbie, um, but who might be interested also in themselves becoming connected to the adventure, the challenges, the benefits of becoming um, somebody who would study forest canopies. Uh, although this was actually picked up by the New York Times, the, Sunday, the, the Science Times, uh, word got out to Mattel that we were, uh, we were producing treetop Barbies. I got a phone call from them. Uh, they said, you can't do this. And I said, well, you know, I know many journalists who would be interested in knowing that Mattel is trying to shut down a, a small brown woman who's trying to encourage girls to go into <laughs> sand. So they said, OK, you can do that. Uh, but keep it small. Anyway, it has been since picked up by the National Science Foundation on their website. So we've gotten some validation that, in fact, this connection, this weaving together of the ecological values of canopies and forests with the value of who Barbie is, her glamour, her beauty, her excitement for young girls, um, is a valid way to think about broader impacts. We, we have tried Ken, one support Ken, but unfortunately, this has not been a very good seller, so he's sort of off the shelf. But this, this, lesson, this really taught me a lesson, this possibility of linking ecological and scientific values of my science and the nature that I think is so important with other values that exist in society already. That is not shoving the ideas of the importance of forest canopies down the throats of others, but rather to say, how can we weave together these ecological values with existing societal values? So what I'd like to do with the rest of my time is to talk about how my students and I, my colleagues and I, have brought together the values of diversity, ecosystem cycles, and wildlife resources of forest canopies and trees and nature in general with aesthetic values, spiritual values, and social justice values. So we'll start with aesthetic values. Well, it's really easy to connect forests, of course, with aesthetic values. People have been, artists have been inspired by uh, forest sounds, by forest sights, by forest smells to create art and music and other artistic ventures. But the approach I took was to create what I call canopy confluences. I invited a number of forest ecologists as well as artists and poets, uh, school teachers, uh, Inuits, people who have never seen forests before, for a week, to spend a week out in the forest together. I taught them how to climb trees using these mountain climbing techniques. A biologist and their helpers, their artist helpers, would make moss collections, for example. 
Art, artists would make art about, their, about what they experienced in the forest canopy. We had a group of modern dancers from San Francisco, a, tr a troupe called Capacitor, who came on some of our, our canopy confluences, both in Washington State and in Costa Rica, and they ended up creating this marvelous dance called Biome, which is really a dance about the rainforest, this interweaving of my knowledge of forest canopies and forest ecosystems with the dancers' ability to express uh, the sort of aesthetic aspects, the aesthetic values of the trees and forests that they encountered with us. We brought musicians into the forest canopy, a wooden flute player, an oboist, um, <clears throat> a wooden guitar player. And we also brought one of my students named Duke Brady, who is a rap singer and hip hop artist. Um, and he just made these fabulous little rap songs about being in the forest canopy. And when I recorded those and brought those to you know, primary and secondary school classes where I, I occasionally go to schools, it was really Duke Brady's songs that really excited them. And I realized then that this was another piece of the tapestry, this weaving together of rap music and forest uh, ecosystems, I ended up hiring Caution, his name is Caution, who's a professional rap singer. Uh, we gathered some <clears throat> underserved at-risk youth from Tacoma, Washington to join us on our heavily wooded campus in, in Washington State. In the morning, uh, Caution and a biologist would go out together into the field. Um, I would pick up a stick, for example, and Caution would make some sort of spoken word poetry or rap song about it. And then in the afternoons, we brought the kids into our sound studios, and they made their own songs, their own beats, their own expression of what they had perceived in the forest that morning. And they ended up, after the week, making a little CD of the songs and the spoken word poetry that had been inspired by the forest. So weaving together the culture, the aesthetics, the art that is sort of relevant to this age group, this, this group of people, seem to be a good way to get them excited, them aware of the beauty and importance of forest ecosystems. Another aspect of aesthetics, of aesthetics values, I have to say, <clears throat> is fashion. And <clears throat> I thought, gosh, you know, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. Now, we ecologists usually don't pay too much attention to, far, to fashion, as evidenced here. We don't pay that much attention to clothes. But in fact, clothes are really an important piece of who we are. When you decided to put that orange shirt on this morning, you probably were thinking, well, this is a pretty cool looking shirt. Um, I might be able to you know, sort of impress somebody that I'm trying to impress. Uh, Helga over here wore a very nice uh, green jacket. So she's sort of saying that coming to the seminar is something important. She's sort of honoring the occasion through the medium of her clothes. So then what if I wove together the power of fashion with the beauty, the aesthetic beauty of, of nature? And this was my first attempt. This is a moss cape. And um, it was a marvelous thing. I sewed this cape you know, with a dental floss, so, sewed the moss onto this a piece of cloth. And it was really wonderful. But I couldn't go into parties like I couldn't go to your reception tonight because it tends to shed when you're inside. <laughs> and that wasn't really good. But um, it actually grew. The second year, I actually had to trim it back. And I realized then that this was not the way to go commercially. But what I have decided is that perhaps we could take botanically correct images of nature, like this image of Piper auretum, which is a wonderful plant that grows in the canopy of the Monte Verde cloud forest. It's related to black pepper, that, the pepper that you shake on your scrambled eggs this morning. <clears throat> we print this image onto this, the fabric and then turn it into an attractive piece of clothing. Um, and attached to that is a little hang tag that has information about the species of Piper auretum. So that, for instance, you can see I'm wearing this jacket right here. So if you might say to me, hey, Nalini, that's a really nice jacket. I might say to you, well, this is Piper auretum. It grows in the Monteverde cloud forest. Um, it's related to the black pepper that you put on your scrambled eggs this morning. And if you want to try to save it from in this somewhat endangered ecosystem, you might decide to give money to the Rainforest Action Network or the Monteverde Conservation League. So people wearing this clothing then can become a walking vector of education and of conservation as they move through their day. I'm working now with some fashion professionals at the um, Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. It turns out fashion people are finally realizing that their industry is one that is extremely polluting. It's actually the second most polluting industry of all. And so there are many fashion-minded people and professionals who are now trying to mitigate some of the problems that they have created. They're trying to reduce um, 
their consumption and increase their sustainability. So this idea of linking fashion with nature is actually a very timely thing uh, for the fashion industry and for this idea. So we've talked about aesthetic values. I'd like to move to <clears throat> how we've gone about um, linking the eco ecological values of trees and nature with existing spiritual values. And I think this is really important, especially in the context of broader impacts, because when you realize that over 80% of human beings on our planet self-identify as being religious, as believing in God or some spiritual being, that's 80% of the planet. That's 80% of our population. That's a much larger population than those that identify as environmentalists or conservationists or biologists. So if we might be able to link then uh, trees and nature to spiritual values, it seems like we might have a window, a portal into uh, conservation awareness um, and, and appreciation of nature from a group of people who might not be moved by hearing about 60% of nitrogen is captured by mosses in the canopy. <laughs> and so I'll, I'll just describe some of my attempts to do, to carry this out, this linking of spirituality and, and the ecological values of nature. Um, as I mentioned, my dad was a Hindu, my mother was a Jew, so I, I don't really know that much about the Christian faith, but I have heard about the very important trees on the first page of the Bible, and that is the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So even I know that these trees are very, very special symbols in, um, in the world of Christian, the Judeo-Christian religion. What I did was um, download the Old Testament and I did a search for the word trees and forests. And I found that there were 328 references to trees and forests just in the Old Testament. And so I, I categorized these as a scientist. I categorized them into these categories, verses that related to symbolic and aesthetic use of trees, analogies to life and God, practical use of trees like eating fruit, location description, uh, tree loss is bad, or tree biology. And so I was able then to say, look, all of these verses really relate to things that are very important to humans. And I decided then to look at other world religions, and I found out that, in fact, all world religions have some symbolism or some connection to trees that are important. The Jewish religion has a wonderful holiday called Tub Shabbat, which is a celebration of the new year of trees. And there's a special Seder or ceremonial dinner in which fruits and nuts of trees are eaten and celebrated as being important to Jews. Um, in Eastern traditional sort of uh, spiritual um, traditions, we, we know that trees are places of meditation, places of serenity, places of renewal. The Japanese have a phrase called shinrin yoku, which people, in which if you're troubled or agitated, if you take a walk through the forest or even stand under a tree, that tree will shower down some positive feeling. And, and the word shinrin yoku actually means tree shower. Um, the Native American traditions, many of them often create objects made of wood that celebrate and, and document the animals that, that frequent the woods in which they live, many times on which they depend. Uh, being here in Utah, of course, it's important to understand that what is the role of trees or what is important in trees in the, in the Book of Mormon. And in fact, in 1FI8, there's this description of a tree with white fruits. There's a path or a rod that, that moves toward the tree, and the faithful are to move towards that tree uh, to find some spiritual enlightenment. So my, my conclusion was, in this research that I did um, on religion and trees, was that really every world religion celebrates and understands the value of trees. What I did then was to put together a sermon called Trees and Spirituality, which I offered to uh, churches and synagogues and temples, started knocking on doors and introducing myself to preachers and rabbis and, <clears throat> and monks. Um, it was the Unitarians that first let me into the church, <laughs> not surprisingly. So I took the, 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 you know, the pulpit. That's the place of authority. That is, was really an amazing feeling to step up to that pulpit, to introduce myself not as a Unitarian or a Baptist or a Methodist or a Jew, but rather as a scientist who is deeply interested in understanding the value that the, the congregation reads about in their own holy scriptures to describe the value of trees. So although I talked to them about what I had learned, I was also listening to them to try to understand 
how they judge trees in their traditions. Uh, my students and I have also taken this one little step further. We've gone to the churchyards of, um, of churches and synagogues, and we've mapped out the trees in their churchyards. The assumption here is that um, you know, churches are sacred places. They have sacred ground. And the things that grow there should also be sacred too. And so we made these little booklets about the trees that grow, for instance, in St. Mark's Episcopal Cathedral in Salt Lake City with a little bit of a description of the biology of that tree species as well as a scripture that refers to that tree species so that the people in that congregation can come to understand that they do have trees that are on sacred ground and maybe the trees that are next door to their church might also have some of their sacred characteristics. And maybe those trees up there at the top of the Wasatch Range might also have some of those characteristics that, that require us to protect them, to be aware of their sacredness, um, and to conserve them. So we've talked about aesthetics, we've talked about spirituality, and now I'd like to talk about um, <clears throat> some of the values um, when we think about social justice. And my work with social justice has mainly, um, well, it actually developed out of an ecological question and problem I was trying to solve in the Pacific Northwest. I learned that um, there's this practice of harvesting mosses from, old, from trees in old growth forests of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, these are stripped of their mosses, they're bagged up, and then they're ultimately sold to people in the horticulture trade. Now, this is not sustainable. What did I tell you about how long it takes these mosses to grow back. Like three decades for these just to start growing back. So this clearly is not sustainable. And we also know that these mosses are important in terms of ecosystem function, in terms of holding on to biodiversity, and in terms of providing resources for wildlife. So my thought was that if we could learn how to farm these mosses horticulturally, we might relieve some of the wild collecting pressure that, that goes on in the Pacific Northwest. And I began thinking, well, how do we farm mosses? There's actually no, nothing in the literature about horticulture of mosses because people have always harvested them uh, from their wild state. I began thinking, well, who would be partners in this? I didn't happen to have any students with me at the time, and I didn't have greenhouse space at the Evergreen State College. And it struck me that perhaps the incarcerated men and women of our country and, and state prisons right in my own state of Washington might be excellent partners. That is, they are denied access to nature as part of their sort of a collateral of their sentence. And for me, being kept away from nature would be like the worst thing I could possibly imagine. So probably many of those inmates would really value, would have a value of touching and working with and cultivating and curating and caring for something that was alive and important. Um, I also realized that they probably have a lot of time and space for this. It doesn't take sharp tools to work with mosses. And so I started knocking on the doors of state prisons and asking the superintendents if I could partner with their inmates to learn how to cultivate these mosses. And you can imagine perhaps some of the responses I got when I first started doing this, but happily within, within six months I was able to locate a superintendent who was very forward thinking. He was a superintendent of a a small 400 bed men's uh, minimum security prison, he said, well, you know, it can't hurt. Bring on the mosses. Maybe it'll keep the guys busy and that'll be really great. Well, it did. We taught the men how to tell apart four different species of mosses. Um, we had them do uh, hang some of them in bags like epiphytic mosses. Some were grown in flats. Uh, every month we would get samples from them to dry and weigh and see, look at the rates of, of growth. And after 18 months, we really had, I had as a scientist, I had my answer about which two species of moss were growing the fastest. The inmates really treasured it because they were doing something important. They were contributing to the conservation of these moss species. They also really appreciated the interactions they were having with my graduate students and with me. And the superintendents were really getting something out of this because they said, wow, the men are having more conversations. They're learning to work together. Uh, they seem to be uh, more uh, involved with each other, which was a value uh, of the superintendent uh, in terms of reducing violence and, and altercations between the men. 
And so the, men, the, the prison superintendent said, well, do you have any more conservation projects? I said, well, uh, how about if I start a prison lecture series? So sure enough, it was an easy thing to do. Now that I had my foot in that prison, we had built trust between the administrators and the scientists. We began a monthly lecture series. Uh, I'm giving one here about cedar trees. Uh, the men were very interested, very involved. They asked great questions. And I, was, I found it very easy to bring in scientists to start uh, to sort of populate our lecture series. This became really interesting when we started bringing in lectures about sustainability, about gardening and recycling. And the men began, oh, let me just tell you that uh, some of our, our recent results of those, the prison lectures, was actually an increase in knowledge content. This is the little blue triangle or a little blue diamond is the pre-lecture uh, assessment. And the uh, red square there is the post-lecture assessment. This is the percent of correct responses to science knowledge content questions and attitude about science. We also documented that over 80% want more information about the topic, and 92% of them talk about this topic uh, to others, like their families or their cellmates. So this seems to be, um, this seemed to be really positive. It, was, it didn't take a huge amount of infrastructure in terms of assigning credit, but it was sort of an informal science education approach to bringing science um, to this population. Over time, some of those sustainability lectures became translated into action. Uh, some of the men began, and the, some of the prisons we were working in, began to put in organic gardens. We started a beekeeping program. We started a recycling program, which reduced the amount of landfill trips that uh, trucks had to take from the prison to the landfill. We also began collaborating with conservation groups to engage the men with actually helping uh, conservation efforts. Our first one was uh, carried out in, in partnership with the Washington Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife. Uh, they had an ongoing program to raise the <clears throat> Oregon spotted frog. This is a state sensitive species. The conservationists took eggs from the wild and a few remaining populations out there. They trained the men. They brought them into the prison. Uh, the men raised them from egg to tadpole to adult frog. And then the conservationists took them and released them to protected wetlands. We did the same thing with the, with the Nature Conservancy, but in this case, it was rare prairie plants. Uh, the men in Stafford Creek Correctional Center raised 300,000 plugs of uh, rare prairie plants a year. We worked with the US Fish and Wildlife Service to do similar things with the Taylor Checker Spot butterfly. Uh, when I moved here to Utah six, six years ago, we started another conservation project with the Division of, of uh, Wildlife Services. Uh, there's now a refuge pond on the grounds of the Salt Lake County Jail where 5,000 little tiny leash, leash chub are, are living. The inmates are taking care of them and measuring them at intervals. Uh, we've been working with the Bureau of Land Management to raise sagebrush for sage grouse habitat improvement. And we've also worked with uh, Karen um, Kentering here uh, doing a research project on the native bulrush to try to repopulate uh, the um, areas that have been taken over by Phragmites, a really difficult problem. So here you see the inmates making measurements of bulrush growth rates when exposed to different levels of, levels of water and fertilizer at the Salt Lake County Jail. This project has received a lot of interest uh, from the media from Science Magazine to, if you can believe this, Playboy Magazine. Um, so we really felt that we were doing a great job, that is, encountering, engaging with, in a meaningful and authentic way, uh, with scientists meeting with and engaging um, a population that really does not have an opportunity to engage with science. <clears throat> but a few years ago, I realized that the only inmates that we were encountering were those who were well-behaved and who were of minimum and medium security. We were not getting to inmates in maximum security or solitary confinement, which to my mind are the men and women who need exposure to nature and education the most. What we could not bring scientists, lecturers, conservationists, frogs, soil or plants to the habitat of a man or a woman who is being held in solitary confinement, these nine by 12 cells, Concrete, you can see here, very, very bare. The whole environment is really one that is entirely bereft of nature. But what I realized we might be able to do is to bring nature imagery to these men and women. And so we started a project, the Nature Imagery in Prisons program, now funded by the National Geographic Society, where we first started by saying, which of these nature images do you think you would prefer, which might have a therapeutic uh, 
effect on you, which might make you feel calmer, make you feel more at peace by simply viewing, uh, viewing nature. And we, we collected this information. Um, we had wonderful collaboration with um, the staff and administrators at the Snake River Correctional Center, which is a supermax prison in eastern Washington. They installed a, a projector in the exercise room where the men go once a day for one hour a day, 23 hours in those little tiny cells, one hour a day in a slightly larger cell, which is their exercise room. They're allowed to walk around and there's a chin-up bar. We worked in a cell block where half of the uh, cells uh, had access to one exercise room where we showed nature videos, and the other 24 cells had access to another uh, exercise room where we did not show videos. After one year, we came back. We did um, assessments of the, of the staff as well as the inmates. The men reported that they felt calmer. They could bring that calm feeling back to their cells. But what was most significant is that there were 26, that the men who watched the videos committed 26% fewer violent interactions than the men who did not. So this seemed to be not, a val not only a value to people who are interested in the effects of nature on humans, but it was also a value, it was also a value to the administrators and the officers in the prison itself. So again, linking the values of nature with humans, whatever those human values might be. I have to say that for the scientists who interact with these inmates, uh, whether it's giving a lecture or working with them in terms of a conservation project, that interaction has been so positive that the scientists who go out to the prison to give a lecture or work with the, the inmates come back feeling enriched. They feel that they have done something fantastic, uh, that they've learned from the inmates, and it sort of recharges them in terms of why, after all, we're doing this, this research and education. I want to say just one more thing in terms of um, the prison project. I, you know, I can imagine you will be sitting here thinking like, when does she have the time to visit all these prisons and set up these projects? And this is a big project. This has taken a lot of time. It has taken time to forge and maintain these collaborations, to get the funding from sources that you wouldn't think about might be interested in science education, to convince them that this is important. But I want to assure you that especially the younger people or people here who do not have tenure but would like tenure, that you don't have to spend a whole bunch of time setting up an elaborate project like this prison project. If you can, that's great. But you can do something as simple as one, something I did one afternoon. I mean, I never get my nails done, but I thought, huh, I was watching this pair of young women at a bus stop, and they were like super interested in their, their painted fingernails. Like they were talking about them, they were interested in them, they were comparing them. And I realized, whoa, those young women are really interested in their fingernails. So what if I go to a fingernail parlor and get trees painted on my fingernails? That will give me the opportunity to interact with young women who are interested in fingernails. So I did, and I had them painted bright green. And so you really notice them. So for like the three weeks it took for that fingernail polish to chip off, I had a lot of great conversations about trees with people that probably would not think about talking about trees. But because they were on my fingernails, because I had gone to a fingernail parlor and had that experience, I was able to connect with, able to weave together my interests of trees with those of people who, who find fingernails and fingernail polish interesting. So <clears throat> to sort of bring this to a, a, a stopping point in terms of what I've done, um, I think that the kinds of projects that I've been able to do with my students and colleagues have shown me that it is possible to link these ecological values and weave them together with other values. But I also want to emphasize that these are just, those three were just the three values I happened to pick. There are tons of other societal values ethical values, historical values, health values, economic values that you could use to link whatever it is that you are learning, you are learning about, you are carrying research about in order to complete your broader impacts. So it's not just the ones I talked about, but really it's just up to your imagination uh, in terms of how you might link your science to carrying out public engagement like this. The last thing I want to talk about is um, <clears throat> the question of who is weaving this tapestry. Who is weaving this tapestry between intellectual merit and broader impacts? And one, of the, one set of people who are helping weave this tapestry are higher level science administrators. 
People like John Holdren, the former president's advisor to science, has called for scientists to tithe their time, to spend 10% of their time to do something that will help humanity. Ellen Leshner, the, the emeritus uh, CEO of AAAS, the, which publishes science, has called for more science ambassadors, more training programs, calling it an intimate need to bring together science and society. And Franz Cordova, who's our new, well, not so new anymore, our uh, director of the National Science Foundation, has emphasized and re-emphasized the need for scientists to do excellent broader impacts. So all of these three people from the top down are saying it is time for us scientists to reach out and carry this out. And so when I think about my own work, I think about who's at the loom, who is weaving the loom of intellectual merit and broader impacts. I think of Treetop Barbie. I think of the clergy people who let me into their churches. I think of the dancers who made that dance. I think of the inmates who, who grew those 300,000 plugs. And I think, I think all four of these, for example, are those who are also at this loom. And I'd like to sort of set the framework of this with a wonderful recent paper that was written by Julie Rizian and Martin Storsky at Oregon State University, who talked about an impact identity. The fact that we scientists think of ourselves usually as having a single identity, a scientist identity. But in fact, scientists have multiple identities. They might have an artistic identity. They might have a family identity or a social values identity as well as their science identity. And so when I reflect on the work that I've done both as a scientist and as someone deeply interested in communication, I can sort of pull threads between the things that I kind of did instinctively and the actual impact identity that made that happen. So my childhood identity as a kid who loved to climb trees really relates to that childhood plaything that I ended up creating. My artistic identity as a kid, and continuing, because I still love modern dance, really, I think, drove and allowed me to interact with that dance group that I talked about. My family identity, my dad was a Hindu, my mother was a Jew. Those two religions just intermingled without a problem at all as I was growing up, allowed me to be open-minded, allowed me to invite myself into churches and synagogues with the knowledge that I would be accepted if I just was straightforward about how all religions have the same, many of the same values. And finally, my social values identity, myself as a person who cares about people, an I'm an empathetic person, I'm a communicator, that I think is what led me and allowed to identify with prisons and the corrections industry. And so what this has led me now to do is to create what I call the STEM Ambassador Program. It's funded by the National Science Foundation. This is the third year of our program. And this is really about <clears throat> trying to train other scientists to do this kind of of impact identity work, to, to reach out to audiences that might never come into a, a museum or go to a zoo or pick up a, a natural history ma magazine. We have developed a whole sort of circle of um, training pieces that involve connecting to a, to a public group, immersing ourselves in that group, designing an appropriate en engagement event, engaging with that group, and then reflecting on what that event has, has taught us. And I'll just give you a few very brief um, results from the last couple of years. Um, Julie McGonigal is a microbiologist. She is also does her own fermentation cooking. She makes kombucha and kimchi. So we linked her up with a local grocery store that has an existing cooking class in fermentation. And so she brought her microscope and microbes, and she taught people, as they were chopping the cabbage to make sauerkraut, who the microbes are that actually are responsible for turning cabbage into sauerkraut. And they were deeply interested in this because they really wanted to make good sauerkraut. <laughs> this is an example of a young uh, a grad student, Rebecca Bruders, <clears throat> who studies pigeon genetics with Mike Shapiro at the University of Utah. Oops. Um, she, is <clears throat> she was raised by a single mom. So her, one of her identities is being the daughter of a single mom. And so she said she wanted to interact with a public group that is composed of moms. So we found a mom's meetup group with her over the internet. She brought her pigeons, her pigeon food, and a PowerPoint about pigeon genetics to a mom's meetup group where there were kids. They brought their kids as well. And so she was giving the message to them, to these moms, that a scientist like her, an emerging scientist like her, felt it was important, felt that they were worthwhile 
people to interact with to convey her information about pigeon genetics. And so that was a message of her placing herself and her identity as the daughter of a single mom into this situation. Uh, this third one, this last example, is um, uh, Dave Belknap here. He uh, runs our electron microscopy uh, facility. And he thinks that his images of viruses are just beautiful. And so he and a collaborating artist has made a coloring book of viruses that has information about viruses. But you know, there's this craze of coloring books going on right now. So he is now marketing his coloring book of viruses, virus images, um, <clears throat> to a publisher that will hopefully go out and um, provide information about how cool viruses are, how important they are, and some scientifically sound information about them. So uh, we are planning to continue that STEM ambassador program. Mark Brunson, who's here and who has done an amazing job of, of science communication and public engagement, uh, will be working with us. Hopefully, we'll be able to bring the STEM ambassador program here um, to USU and to other institutions across the country. We think this is sort of just the beginning of using this approach of realizing that we as scientists have multiple identities that can be useful in creating successful broader impacts. So with that, talking about the tapestry of the forest, the tapestry of uh, intellectual merit and broader impacts, the tapestry really that all of us are in terms of being both scientists and communicators, I would love to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. And could you tell us your name, too? I, I don't know anybody. Well, I know a few people here, but I'm Mary, Mary Bob, um, did you ever approach any of the women's uh, jails? Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. I should have meant I kept talking about men. Uh, we have been working um, both in Washington State. We've been working with the Women's Correctional Center of Washington. Uh, um, the Women's Correctional Center of Washington uh, in Washington State, that's a women's prison. We've been working with the women's prison in um, Portland, Oregon. And in um, Utah, we've been working with the Timpanogos Prison, which is part of the Draper State Prison Complex. Uh, we also are, now are working in juvenile detention centers. We're working at five centers. Uh, and one of them is called the, the Girls Transition Center, which is an all-girls juvenile detention center. So for us, that's really important. Actually, the sagebrush growing project was carried out uh, by the women uh, by the women, and it was a really wonderful opportunity. There, there was a very different sort of dynamic um, in terms of working with science with them, much more personal. Um, the, the women that we had, worked, the women scientists who worked with them, found that there was just really tremendous connections going on uh, with the women inmates there. Thank Thanks for that question. Yeah, in the back with the... That's a great question. So I think what you're asking is, is there a deleterious effect of these epiphytes on the trees? Um, there have been a few papers that have said, oh, look, the epiphytes are growing on these dead branches. Therefore, the, the epiphytes are killing the branches. But it's really the opposite, that when there are dead branches, there's more exposed sunlight, and that's where the epiphytes tend to be. So the, I haven't found any papers that have actually found a deleterious effect on them. Now, there might be more moisture on the bark that might encourage fungal growth or bacterial growth or some disease. There are actually some evidence that I, I didn't talk about here, but I will tomorrow, about some of the um, mutualistic effects between these epiphytes and their host trees. For example, one thing that I learned, I discovered actually in 1981 when I first started this, was you remember that the mosses and then that dead organic matter, that canopy soil? Well, some trees are capable of putting roots from their own branches and trunks into that soil and gathering nutrients and water from those moss mats themselves. So there's actually a more direct pathway of nutrient transfer from the mosses and the dead organic matter that, that get their nutrients from outside the ecosystem that then flows into the trees that, they, that are themselves supporting these mats. So you can sort of think about it as paying rent to the landlord in a funny way. Um, so that question still remains open. We haven't been able to demonstrate one way or other if there has been a negative effect. There's a long-term experiment I would love to do, um, which would be to strip mosses off and epiphytes off trees as they grow up um, to see whether or not there's a difference in investment in structural strength or height growth. But that would probably take 
longer than my lifetime. So I'm now recruiting graduate students, maybe even undergraduate students, to, to think about that as a possibility. Good question. Yeah, the red. Yeah, that is a super duper question. I was actually having a great conversation with Nancy Huntley this morning about um, about what is the, what are the academic values of doing this this work. Uh, clearly, it takes time, it takes energy, and when we look at what might be considered traditional uh, academic values, which are what publications, publications money. money, academic awards. Pats on the back from your dean or from your, your provost, right? Those are all things that, that we consider academic awards. And to tell you the truth, with all of the work I've done with Broader Impacts, I've maybe published three papers about the work that I've done with prisoners and so forth. So, so in terms of academic output, that's, you know, that's a tiny percentage of all of my, not that I've published all that much, but it's a, it's a fairly small number. Um, in terms of funding, for me, who's done a lot of investing in this, um, I actually, I have gotten quite a lot of funding from the education side of the National Science Foundation, from the National Geographic and so forth. But that isn't true of, you know, everybody who, who sort of does this. And, and yet, and, and here's, here's a figure which I think is very telling. If we think, oh, there's very few or no academic benefits, you would think, well, then academics wouldn't do this. But the recent Pew 2015 study that came out stated that 49% of scientists, this was based on a sample size of nearly 4,000 AAAS scientists, state nearly, it's almost half of our scientists, active scientists, are doing some kind of public engagement. And so the question is, why? If we scientists are robotically looking for ways to get more publications and more money and more accolades uh, from atmos uh, for academics, then why the heck are 40, almost 50% of us doing public engagement? Oh, let me get to that in a minute. Let me just sort of finish this thought, and then I'll get to that. Are you answering? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Right. Say that again. Right. Okay. Uh, many people, in, we've, we've done a lot of evaluation of these STEM ambassadors that we've trained. We've trained 45 STEM ambassadors. We've done extensive interviews with them. I've done some surveys uh, drawing on scientific professional societies. And the answers that I get back, I kept hoping I would come back with, you know, they would come back with saying, oh, I, I think this was really good for my academic career. But what they said was, I feel good when I do this. It's my duty to do this as a scientist. I'm getting paid with public money and therefore I should do this. This is fun. I like being connected with people outside the university. This is a nice break from the lab. But most of all, it was, I, this is, it was about making meaning of our work. Why did we get into science to begin with? Was it to have a long list of publications? I don't think so. I think most of us went into science and are in science because we want our work to make a difference. And of course it makes a difference to other scientists, our peers, but by doing this kind of work, it also makes a difference to the world out there. And so I think that what I'm coming around to believe now is the reason that people do this is not really for the academic values. It's for these other values, these human values, the sense of connectedness and responsibility that we have not yet learned how to measure. We don't have metrics for those values. And so it seems like they're invisible. But I think maybe it's time to start thinking about how do we, if not measure them with metrics, like a dollar bill or a number of pages of published papers, at least to document that they exist and to help us understand why many scientists are in fact motivated to do this. So that's sort of your answer from the ground up, why individual scientists do this. I've also been talking with, with science administrators, academic administrators. There's a wonderful new group called the National Alliance for Broader Impacts that's funded by NSF. And they are doing a lot of asking senior, senior academic administrators about institutionalization of broader impacts. And it seems to be that high-level provosts, deans, and so forth, 
and presidents especially are saying, yes, we want our scientists to do this kind of bro um, broader impact connecting to the community because especially state universities are paid by state citizens. So the more we can connect with them, the more we can bring our science directly or indirectly to them, the better the university looks. And that's kind of a crass way to put it because I think sincerely presidents do want to you know, to, to be of, of use to the universe, uh, to the community. Our president, new president, first woman president, by the way, in, uh, at the University of Utah, Ruth Watkins, she prefaces all of her remarks now by saying, well, we are the University of Utah, but actually we are the, versa, the university for Utah. And so this kind of work that I described here of putting scientists in prisons, in senior assisted living centers, in cooking classes, those kinds of interactions are of value to seniors, senior, senior administrators. And so what I'm seeing is that we get senior administrators like my president, like Alan Leshner, like Franz Cordova, who are beginning to put pressure from the top down that we need to do this. And I'm also seeing, especially in emerging scientists, in the graduate students and the young assistant professors, that this idea of these non-academic rewards, the sense of contribution and responsibility, that's beginning to drive the desire to do broader impacts from the bottom up. And somewhere in the middle, I think, and I don't know how long it will take, I think those two are going to come together. And so that scientists will say, when I publish a scientific paper, I'm not done. It's when I take that somewhere outside, then I'm done with that project and I can move to the next one. And so I think that shift, that transition, I think is, is about to come, but it's not quite there yet. And I think there are more and more tools like training programs like the SEM Ambassador Program, um, the Leshner Fellows, which is offered by the AAAS, there are a lot more of those resources that are beginning to come to us. But academic systems are slow to change, and I don't think that we can rush them. Uh, we can keep pushing, but I don't think that we can expect that they're going to change overnight. Back to your question, the gentleman in the green shirt. When I started? Maybe on these projects, like what kind of challenges? Uh, the challenges, I think, well, I, would, I think we would all say time. Um, if I take time away from my writing my paper for Ecologia, then it's, you know, that, that's not good. But I think also the challenges were that some of my colleagues didn't think this was a very worthwhile use of time. And I think because we're in a system that relies on peer review, we're often very sensitive to what our colleagues think. So I have to say when I started doing this as a graduate student and a young assistant professor at UC Santa Barbara, I, w I, was, I kept my engagement stuff hidden. I wouldn't talk about it with anybody. I would just go quietly to the Girl Scout group. You know, I didn't, I didn't blast it out the way I'm standing in front of you and blasting it out now. So part of it was this peer pressure. Part of it was the, like the disbelief or the not understanding of the public groups when I would show up as a scientist at a prison, at a church, uh, at a community center of urban youth, it was like, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And so it took some time to help them understand what I wanted to get out of it from them and what they might get out of my being there. Um, I think another piece that was challenging, especially for the prison project, which was not apparent to me at the beginning, um, I thought everybody would love this prison project, and for the most part they do. But at least in Utah, for example, there, on both sides of the political spectrum, there has been some resistance. On the side of the right, there are many people who believe that prisoners should be punished, they shouldn't be given anything, that that's what prison is about. Even in the face of the fact that we know that educate, providing education and job training is going to reduce recidivism. But, the, but, but there's the sense that the legislature should not be paying for education in prisons. But there was also resistance from the far left they would, when I've given talks, uh, some people have stood up and said, but wait a minute, those guys who are raising frogs, they're getting paid 42 cents an hour. You're exploiting prison labor. And it's like, oh, I didn't really think of it that way. I thought we were offering opportunities to learn about, you know, animal husbandry, uh, you know, um, animals in general, just uh, working with living things giving them encouragement, linking them with other students, linking them with education. So this idea that this kind of work could actually be repressive um, is, is another attitude that comes around some of the, at least this prison project. So I think when you start 
carrying out these broader impacts, especially with underserved, scientifically underserved public audiences, you have to really be um, ready to take that. You have to be ready to, if not just defend yourself, to be able to accommodate that there might be people who think what you're doing isn't right or isn't virtuous or isn't something that should even be done. And so I've had to sort of set up a little bit of a thicker skin with some of these projects because I have gotten rejections and um, you know that's, that's a hard thing to do for somebody who wants to excel and, and achieve and, and get things done. So all of those things represent challenges, but then we face challenges when we do our scientific work as well. And so, you know, you get a paper rejected from Ecologia and you feel really horrible. Um, and so you have to kind of live with that. And so it, in some ways, I think those kinds of challenges are not the same, but they may be sort of parallel. Was a lot of it? Yeah, I think, um, well, you know, I haven't told you all my failures either, so, you know, I have a whole <laughs> list of those. But, like, the fashion thing, for example, this is an idea I have had for probably 15 years. You know, it started with that moss, that silly moss cape. Well, that was a long time ago. But I believe that this is a good idea. And so I'm constantly just talking about it. I give my friends scarves with aspen leaves on them as Christmas presents, just to sort of keep trying. And I, when I went to New York City last year, um, I just dropped by the Fashion Institute of Technology, started knocking on doors, you know, just, just persisting and shoving my face and saying, I think this is a good idea. And it, it actually paid off. So I think persistence is certainly one ingredient. I think deep belief in the importance of what you're doing, whether it's an experiment in your lab or trying to forge a pathway to uh, an audience where a, fa a path hasn't been forged yet, that deep belief, that sincere, authentic belief in wanting to connect has been very important uh, from my standpoint. I think the willingness to listen, to be humble, to say, you know, I have never read your Bible. I, I just haven't ever read it. I need to know about it. To talk to urban youth and say, you know, I couldn't do a hip hop song standing up like you guys do to save my life. So please teach me how to do it. That openness, that being able to say, I don't know, is something really hard for a lot of scientists to say because we are so used to standing at the podium, giving the lecture, giving the exam, and telling which, which answers are right or wrong. So I think going into this with this attitude of I, I'm going to learn as well as offer, I think that has been one of the reasons why this has been successful. Uh, yes? Yeah, I think they're all interested in science and nature. It's really funny because when we wrote the grant proposal for the STEM ambassador program, our first paragraph was, we are seeking to engage scientifically unengaged audiences. And what we have learned is we have never yet encountered a scientifically unengaged audience. They have all been open. They have all offered us information. And I think that's because we make this correct connection. We say, who would be interested in trees? Not random people, but people who go to church and who read the Bible and know the first page that there's a tree of life and a tree of good and evil. Those are the people who care about trees. Loggers are interested in trees. I've never had a fight with a logger because he knows how to cut down trees and he understands trees far better than I do. And I've taken years of ecology and physiology classes. So when you approach this with a sense of I can connect you because of my research or because I'm half Indian, I can talk to any Indian about, I can waggle my head just right, you know, because of that, <laughs> they wouldn't understand. And I can also talk to Jews because that is part of what I, what I am. And so when you draw upon that for your connection to these seemingly unengaged audiences, then you have engagement. And I think that really is a great way to, to sort of end this, this seminar is that, is that people are engaged in science and if you can approach them in the right way, with respect, with humbleness, and with a sense of understanding of why you're connecting with them in particular, you will have an easy time with your broader impacts. Thank you.